This is Teachers Talk Radio, and you are listening live. Hello and welcome to the morning break. My name is Graham Stanley, and my guest today is Sarana Munith, a teacher from Uruguay who has worked in Argentina and Colombia. We'll be talking about teaching without borders, which is the fact that teachers nowadays often teach outside the country they live in. This is Teachers Talk Radio, and you are listening live. Tune in live at ttradio.org, or to join in the conversation, download the Podbean app and search Teachers Talk Radio. Follow the hashtag TT Radio. Tune in, talk it out with Teachers Talk Radio. Welcome back to the morning break, everyone. I'm Graham, speaking to you live from Mexico City. On today's show, I'll be talking live to Sarana Manith from Uruguay. I first met Sarana in Montevideo back in 2013, when we both worked on an exciting and ambitious project to teach English remotely to primary school students across the country using video conferencing technology. The project is still going strong, but Sarana moved on, and although now back in Uruguay, she was living and working in a school in the beautiful Patagonia in the south of Argentina for some time. Sarana is also a teacher trainer and coordinator for a project in Colombia. Now I'll be talking to Sarana after the Teachers Talk radio news. This episode of Teachers Talk Radio has been made possible with support from Witherslack Group, the UK's leading provider of SEN education and care. They're here to support you too through an ever-growing offer of free resources, including webinars, podcasts, articles and events aimed at supporting teaching professionals like you. Visit their website at www.witherslackgroup.co.uk to find out more. This is Two Minute Tech with Steve Woods, your tech briefing on Teachers Talk Radio. Hello, this week I'm starting a series on home connection speed and getting the best performance. Everybody wants the best performance for their devices at home, with more and more things needing the internet or a home network connection to provide interactivity and additional functionality, ensuring you can get a good connection is essential. Most people use Wi-Fi as their home setup, so I'll start with this and also try and explain basically how a home network works. First, let's understand what devices are doing when you add them to your Wi-Fi network. Wireless fidelity, or Wi-Fi as it's commonly known, is a high-frequency signal that's being invisibly transmitted around your home. If you have access to the signal, you can send and receive data. This is what your phone, laptop, tablets, internet-enabled TV, wireless alarms, even some door locks and fridges are connecting through to communicate and most of the time use the internet to add functionality to your ever-growing smart home. The more devices you have, the more demand is placed on your network to transmit data. Comparing your home network to the network of corridors in your school and throwing in some geeky tech words, bandwidth is the size of the corridor and dictates how much traffic or people that can be handled. Classrooms are the devices and the staff and pupils are the data that the devices need. Using the school as a physical example of a network, during lesson time when everybody's in place, it's easy to travel around the network of corridors and people or data can travel at normal walking speed or faster if you're feeling the need to. On lesson change or at break time, lots of people need to be somewhere else. Pupils need to walk slower, follow rules such as walking on a certain side or in a certain direction, doorways create queues and the journey from A to B during this time can take considerably longer. This is due to the physical constraints of the corridor it cannot get any bigger, so people need to move slower. Comparing this to your home network, bandwidth is the amount of data that can be sent at a given time. It's measured in bits per second, a bit being a one or a zero. That's binary, the computer's language. So a one megabit bandwidth means one million ones and zeros can be transmitted in a second. If you decide to look up your Wi-Fi speed, you'll find some really interesting facts, but also risk being sent to sleep. A modern Wi-Fi network on paper is capable of transmitting 1,300 megabits per second. That's 1,300,000,000 ones and zeros every second. 
Oh wow. There are, however, loads of factors to consider, the main one being the number of devices sharing the bandwidth at a given time. Over this series, I'll be looking at what you can do to help you get the best performance from your home network. For now, I hope you're beginning to understand what's happening on your home network and why at busy times it can slow down. Today's takeaway tip is if you need good performance, then make sure other devices are not reducing the bandwidth that you are receiving. If this has given you food for thought, I'd love to hear from you. Why not get in touch at TT Radio 2022? Follow us and tell us what you want to know about tech i'm steve woods and that was two minute tech two minute tech with steve woods your tech briefing on teachers talk radio if you're listening to this then we know we share one thing in common a passion for the type of outstanding education that every child deserves that's what makes us the leading provider of specialist education and care we need people like you to help us achieve even more with us You'll be given all the resources and support you need, offered a clear path to career progression, and be rewarded with some of the best salaries and benefits the industry has to offer. We are with a Slack group. If you'd like to find out more, we'd love to hear from you. Visit www.withaslackgroup.co.uk forward slash careers and be part of our future. So welcome back to the morning break on Teachers Talk Radio, everybody. I am here with my very special guest, Sarana Munith. How are you, Sarana? And what have you been up to recently? Hello, Graham. Thank you for inviting me here. Um, well, recently, right now, I'm I'm living in Rocha in Uruguay. I came back to Uruguay recently. And um, I've been working, well, it's been a year already since I started working for English Without Borders Colombia. And and I'm also studying here. I'm studying environment, um, yeah, environmental management and getting involved slowly into different local projects. Fantastic. I think until recently you were living and working in Patagonia in Argentina, which is a spectacular part of the world. And I'd love to hear a little bit more about that experience when you decided to go there, what it was like being in a teacher in a school over there and, and um, why you decided to come back. To Uruguay. Um, all right. Well, yes, uh, Patagonia and Bariloche in particular, which is where I was living, is like so beautiful. Um, so uh, you and I met when I was uh, working for Plan Cibal and I was there for many years. And um, and at the very end of it, I mean, it was um, so rewarding to work for Plan Cibal because I learned so much and I felt I could contribute so much to the projects I, I worked in. Uh, but it's also a very intense place of work. So after some years, I was exhausted, stressed. Uh, so so when I left, I decided to take some months off just to relax. Uh, and so I went traveling and I got to Bariloche and I went mountain trekking and, you know, disconnecting, no electricity, no connection, nothing, just enjoying the views, the nature. And I just fell in love with it, with with the landscapes and 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 with that lifestyle of being so close to nature in in your daily life, that I just decided I wanted to live there. So the following year, I moved to Bariloche, and I was really lucky because uh, very soon I got um, a job in in QMAC, which is the school uh, for which I worked while I was there, uh, that has a very interesting approach. Like, um, well, the courses start with, with mountain trekking with the students. So wow. you, you really bond with them. Yes, it's amazing. Um, but also like they give you a lot of freedom as a teacher. Of course, you just have to submit a plan of what you are going to do, but then uh, they they really let you innovate and, and, and promote that. So, so it was great because I was able to put into practice lots of things that I've always thought, but then, you know, you never have the time because you have to comply with, with, with so many management requests that, that kind of limit what you can do. And I was also invited, like at the end of the first year, I was clearly the, the techie English teacher. <laughs> so uh, they, they approached me and said that they had realized that, that first year students uh, didn't have a basic digital skills to to, to cope with the, the 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 demands of secondary life school secondary school life um so they invited me to design a subject for the following year 
on on digital skills, um, which was a very interesting process because um, I talked with management, but also with the other teachers who who were involved with technology at the school, and we had very different views because they were mostly uh engineers or like that sort of profile and they wanted me to teach them you know spreadsheets formulas and uh, uh how to change the format in in you know all those computers computing skills which are important of course but i wanted to also work on uh, uh privacy understanding the digital footprint uh, um, identifying reliable sources of information netiquette develop an empathy when when you relate with others through uh, devices um so we had to compromise and and the subject had a bit of both uh, it was called uh, beyond fortnight it was the name that we chose for that subject and and then the pandemic came and and I think that's when they understood why I wanted to work on all of those things because we had twelve year olds who were like exposed to so many hours of classes and and other things through through their devices that it it became really important to work on those things. Um, so I loved it, uh, and and it was great. I like the, the teamwork and everything. Um, I, I feel I was so lucky to get there. Wow, that's fantastic. That's uh, really interesting. I'm becoming more and more interested in this idea of digital skills and what digital skills are needed by uh, students, um, but also teachers, I think. Did you have an opportunity to help teachers with digital skills as well, or was it just the students when you were there? Yes, not so much, but also uh, (laughs) because, again, I really feel like I was so lucky because while I was there, I was teaching in the secondary school, but there was this idea of starting primary as well. Back then, the school only had secondary school. So um, for a a whole year, we worked on on planning the primary school. And I mean, from from scratch, like the building was built specifically for that. So we discussed, uh, we even discussed what the building should look like and also what would be the the approach to technologies. So uh, that's when I got to help teachers, not so much as in formal training, but but in, in being part of these discussions and providing my point of view uh, from being an expert on, on, on learning technologies. Wow. And another question related to this is, where where do you start? How did you go about designing this curriculum or this syllabus of digital skills for secondary school students? I think it's really interesting that you called the course Beyond Fortnite, uh, because, of course, Fortnite is probably the uh, the game that the students uh, spent most of their time doing and there is this kind of misconception that secondary students are very good with technology uh, because they spend so much time online with a computer or or mobile etc but actually it's what they're actually doing with the uh, computer playing computer games for example which can be very useful when it comes to digital skills but there's a lot more to uh, developing digital skills as you sort of hinted at when you were talking about elements of the syllabus so how did you go about sort of designing uh, what they needed to know and where you know where did you start with them um all right well um it's exactly what you've just described is what we discussed in in the team of teachers and that's how we came up with the name which i mean is Great on one side. On the other side, students expected to play Fortnite. <laughs> <laughs> and, and they were disappointed that that was not what was going to happen. Um, but uh, it was a combination of um, gathering information about what, what teachers from different subjects identified as needs. Because, of course, the technology teachers were the ones that were invited to the meetings. But actually, I don't know. I remember talking to uh, some teachers, well, some English teachers who told me, well, I would really love for students to understand uh, plagiarism. Um, so when it's an original source or a source that is quoting another one and, and what they can do to avoid plagiarism, just like as an example of things that different teachers had identified. 
combined that with lead review of the, right what uh digital literacy is and what skills are involved there um and then i started uh the year like the first couple of lessons were uh, diagnostic and 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 also like learning from students like how they see themselves and their needs and also with uh, some quizzes and some tasks for me to also uh, evaluate where they stood and and from there on we built it and as it was uh, the first time this course was taught I was adjusting as I went like okay this is the plan but then uh, real life happens and, and you adjust and, and the school was very flexible uh, on that just uh, uh, helping and promoting this. Wow, that sounds great. And you also mentioned that things changed during the pandemic. I'm guessing the starting of the day with mountain trekking, that was abandoned during the pandemic, or did the students do that on their own? <laughs> no, actually in Argentina, the, the restrictions were, were really harsh. Um, and so we we were asked to stay at home and really like just go out to go to a supermarket and and you could only go to the supermarket um the day that in, depending on on the the end digit of of your identity number uh and and they really put a, a lot of effort into enforcing that so uh it was really hard for because these students like they live in Bariloche they are used to going mountain trekking and skiing and mountain biking like like they are very active and this school in particular that had that that profile of students and suddenly they had to stay inside for a whole year we didn't have face-to-face -face classes for the whole year and and for teenagers like the meeting their peers is because of the stage of their life when when they where they are it's the most important side of their life so it was really challenging uh, emotionally because uh, we had at the beginning they were like <laughs> doing their best thinking that it would be just a while and we all needed to make an effort together but but after months kept going by and and they still couldn't meet face to face it was they were very demotivating that demotivated they they were stressed they were like um that it, it really hit them emotionally so we just had to adjust and respond to to their needs so i would spend like a lot of the time in my classes just letting them talk vent express their frustration and think about what we can do with what we have because that's the situation and there wasn't much that we could do of course i mean i I, mean, I know the pandemic was very difficult for uh, a lot of people for everyone really to a certain extent but i think probably the uh, the age group that was hit the hardest with it is i would say is you know teenagers because at that moment in in their lives you know what they need is to socialize with their peers and to uh, you know to have that contact with others that is so important um i don't know um, i think it was probably the worst for them wasn't it yeah certainly so i'd like to turn now to environmental education which you said you are studying um so I know this is a particular interest of yours these days. Could you tell me what it is exactly and <laughs> how you became interested in it? Um, sure. Well, I'm not actually studying environmental education, but okay. I've done some courses in that. It's more it's environmental management, which ah. is more comprehensive. But I want to focus on uh, environmental education, uh, which it, in a nutshell is just educating for sustainability, which means like. Uh, developing a critical understanding of environmental issues and working towards um, becoming better at <laughs> relating with the environment though perhaps relating is not the best word because it's like we are part of the environment right it's... yeah that's interesting what kind of things do you study then if we delve a little bit deeper into your course um, what aspects of environmental management are um, are involved in in your course, and which are the parts of it that you, you're more interested in? 
Um, well, that 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 question has a long answer because it's it's actually a degree and it's it's four years long. Okay. <laughs> so there's many aspects to it, and and then there are different profiles within the the career. Um, so you can uh, devote more to um, to the the management of uh, fishing and and how to do it so that it's environmentally sustainable, uh, or um, production of fruits, vegetables, uh, cattle. That's that's another of the paths. Uh, another one is about uh, organization of of the territory, like. Um, planning like city and town planning and 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 company planning and etc um again always bearing in mind uh the development that is sustainable and okay environmental education is not one of the pathways but it will be i'm sure <laughs> <laughs> and and we do have a lot of uh we, we do have certain subjects that are on environmental education and lots of workshops um and then of course there's um the the, sub, the the career has like um, different areas that you need to have a minimum number of credits per areas like uh, exact sciences like maths physics um, chemistry is one um, I don't remember the name but like biology uh, ve uh, vegetable biology animal biology um, geology um, th that's another one and there's another one that is social sciences and there's a, there's a component of interdisciplinary subjects uh, and then there are optional subjects so you need to have credits in each of them in order to to complete the career and the idea is that you choose the subjects within those areas uh, oriented towards the profile that you wish to um, later work on. Okay. And about environmental education then, is is it possible to study that as well? Or um, and in which case, what would that involve? Yes. Um, well, it would involve managing educational projects uh, that 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 aim that well that are aimed at environmental sustainability, um, and also there are many environmental management projects that uh, happen in, um, in educational environments, but that are not actually environmental education, like uh, dealing with an with a with a problem, for instance, within an an educational institution. It's, it's actually environmental management. You're, you're managing the problem, but if it doesn't have certain other characteristics, like uh, the problem that you are addressing coming from students' interest and then making a profound analysis of uh, what causes it and, and what you can do about it and who, which are the other factors that are affecting it, um, then, if if you're not doing a number of things, then it's not really environmental education; it's environmental management. Uh, but those are possible areas of work. Okay, and um, what do you see yourself doing when you finish the course in three plus years' time? <laughs> Well, I see myself doing exactly that. And I imagine articulating all my interests because I don't want to give up teaching. I don't want to give up teaching English. I don't want to give up uh, um, teaching digital literacies. Those are things that I'm passionate about. I just think that this is uh, something that I can articulate with those things and work in educational projects that address all of these things. And, you know, a concept that I was really interested in when I started studying uh, environmental education is ecophobia. Uh, for me, it was eye-opening. I don't know if you've wow. heard of it. I've never heard of that, no. Okay, well, what the, it's it's the, the paper that the discuss or article, I don't know, it's called Beyond Ecophobia, if I'm not mistaken, uh, where the concept was introduced and coined. Um, but basically what it says is that um, traditionally, when uh, the environment has been addressed in classrooms, it's been from a perspective that is like um, the world is going to end and we are destroying it. And 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 what can that cause on students? Like the feeling of panic, anxiety, mm. uh, you know? And, and for me, like I was 
reading about this and I was thinking, you know, Greta Thunberg in one of her famous speeches, she said, uh, you've stolen my childhood. And it, and it, and it's like, I mean, I, I, I really admire all those students who are activists and trying to, to change things, but, uh, they are kids and they are so worried. I mean, we, the adults, should be the ones taking action and really doing something about it. And we should be educating kids and teens to love nature, the environment, the world, and grow up loving it. Because if they do so, then they will care for it. Without, I mean, they need to have an, an understanding of the problems. But if we start from the local problems that we can do something about it, about instead of starting with the, the, the thin polar bear that is so far from us and that there's little that we can do to help, um, it's completely different what, what the, the feelings that they will have because um, emotional education is also a very important part of uh, environmental education. So I imagine myself uh, doing that, uh, working in environmental projects that have those characteristics. And that's why um, for me, um, working at this school in, in Argentina is approaching it from, from that point of view. Like these kids that st start the school year going to the mountains and with a policy of, of leave no trace when, when they go to the mountains and, and, and they enjoy it so much and appreciate everything that you can um, enjoy when you are in that close contact with nature and 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 they really kind of serve and understand like the 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 different animals that live there and and the native uh trees native plants uh, they, they they value that and and while they are little that's enough <laughs> We also did like, um, you know, well, not me, but the, the, the project has like planting fruit trees for the future and having a vegetable garden that you can also observe the cycles and the, the, the times of nature. Um, and, and, and of course we do take action. I'm not saying that that's not good. Uh, I'm just saying like where to place the focus and, and, and things to look out for, like what are we generating on the students emotionally? Wow, yeah, there's a lot. There's a lot there to uh, to think about. Uh, what you said about echophobia was quite interesting because I started to remember when I was a teenager, quite a long time ago, I have to say. Um, <laughs> but my my big fear was um, the fear of nuclear war, and I grew up as a teenager with that as as a real sort of uh, fear that was potential um i remember seeing a documentary i don't know how old i was maybe young uh, young teenager and not being able to sleep very well at all after it because it, it did seem like it was a big threat over the world so i can imagine that uh a lot of children and teenagers these days have that feeling that you've just expressed about ecophobia yeah, and, and you can feel like so helpless. I, yeah. I remember it, like a similar feeling when I was in primary school, which was also a long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, definitely. Um, so if we turn now to another type of teaching that I know you're involved in, another type of education, and that's home-based remote teaching to students in Colombia. Uh, effectively teaching without borders. Uh, could you tell us more about your experience of living in one country and teaching and or teacher training in another? Yeah. Um, well, it's it's been challenging and and very interesting and rewarding because, um, well, I don't know if you've spoken in this show about English without borders before. Okay, so. Um, Basically, what, what we do is we offer students in secondary schools, public secondary schools in different cities in Colombia. Right now we are working with Barranquilla, Bucaramanga and Bogotá. Um, the opportunity to take an intense English course through Zoom after or, or before school, depending on whether they go to school in the morning or in the afternoon. Um, and so 
I gather I don't uh, I've been learning about the Colombian educational system, but that generally they have like very large classes at, at school. So so it's hard to implement like the communicative approach and personalized learning because there are really many, many students. So um, this this project offers them the opportunity to work intensely because also they don't have that many hours of English um, at school in, in a reduced group uh, in which they can really um, receive personalized attention. So, so students are really motivated by that. Students really see it as an opportunity and, and they work so hard to improve and, and you can actually see their progress throughout the months of, of the course. So that's really rewarding. Um, of course, uh, Colombia is a whole new culture for me, even though I've been working in international um, context for a while now. Um, still, it's it's a lot to learn because there are particular characteristics of what makes things work, like how to connect with the students and with the teachers that are specific to, to Colombia. And also we are, um, we are implementing this because uh, we want to... Uh, Ten to one of the problems in 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 the school public school sector in Colombia, and that's uh, I need to understand that. Uh, but it's great because I I've been learning so much, and it's also even though there are differences, there's also many things that are uh, the same challenges that we are facing in in different countries. So it's interesting to see that and to be able to provide like from my experience in in Uruguay, I I. I worked for Plan Cibal, which has different characteristics, but still there's a lot of the remote teaching that goes on there, that the, the, the things that we've learned there, we can apply here as well. Um, and also, uh, I think that a very positive side to it is that we have a very strong uh, CPD in place for the teachers who are part of the program. So we have workshops every two weeks, we have observations, Right now, we are about to start implementing peer observations so teachers can learn from each other. And, and the feedback that we are getting from teachers is that they, they appreciate that and, and they, they, they see that they are also developing as part of the program. Wow, yeah, it's a very exciting program that I think offers um, a lot of opportunities outside of Colombia as well. I think it's something that would be um, would be great to implement um, in other countries. I think one of the things that strikes me as being innovative about the approach is this idea of of using the time that the students are not in school to teach them English. So effectively, you're doubling or even more the amount of um, English classes that the students have. So apart from the smaller groups, the more personalized attention, the sheer number of hours that the students are getting um, exposed to the language is increasing to such an extent that we know the number of hours of exposure to a language really is crucial uh, in when it comes to, to learning it. That is something I think is really interesting. I'd like to hear more about what you think about that and how that has been. It's great to hear that the uh, the students are motivated um, with that. So how how is that sort of um, imp that is important, isn't it? How important is that aspect of it to the success of the project? I I'd say that that very much like the the hours of of exposure certainly are a part of 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 the reason why we are getting really good results you know that as last year it was the first edition um monitoring and evaluating was done very closely so we had like the students took a test at the beginning and then at the end and and progress could really be seen that's why we continued and um it's not only the the hours that they have um of zoom lessons but they we also have a, an online platform platform from Richmond that um, students can do asynchronous work 
uh, some of which, the, well, generally the teacher indicates them what to do, but it's also a great platform for autonomous learning. Like a couple of weeks ago, some students were writing whether it was going to continue being open after the course ended because they want to take advantage of it because it's really, um, it, it's great for autonomous learning because it gives you feedback on, on the moment and and they can go back to what they've already seen. And and that's also, I believe, a characteristic that that's really powerful yeah that's that's really interesting and i think the other thing that is that has one thing that has enabled this as a uh, as a project which i think is really interesting because you're using teachers who are based at home teaching to students who are at home and i think probably it strikes me as that the pandemic has kind of opened up more the possibility of doing that prior to the pandemic i don't think anyone would have sort of thought about this as a serious possibility or potentially that you could do but that is true isn't it this idea of home-based remote teaching students um outside of school hours has become possible because of that isn't it yes yes certainly and and also, like, uh, this is voluntary. Students decide if they want to join um, the program. And and generally, this is the only thing that they are doing um, through Zoom. Um, so it's also, uh, although still it's many hours, so, so there is a risk of Zoom fatigue and we need to develop strategies to avoid that. Um, they can really take advantage of, of that time at, in, in their homes to, to learn. Definitely. It's so interesting. And what is your role exactly on the project, Sarana? Are you teaching on it? Are you teacher training? Are you coordinating? Are you doing a little bit of both, all of those three? <laughs> um, I'm not teaching. Um, I'm, I mean, the, the name of the role is master teacher, which we don't really like <laughs> that name, but well, uh, it's basically a, a academic management. It's a mixture of right. more admin duties that have to do with, with planning um, and, and producing reports, systematizing what's going on, but also, and, and that's the main thing um, with, with other members of the team, we, we, we are in charge of ensuring the, the academic quality of, of the program. Uh, so that's mostly teacher training and teacher development. And that's our, our the core of, of what we do. And how do you determine what a teacher needs to know um, when it comes to this type of teaching? Because it's a very different type of teaching. Um, now, I'm, I'm sure most of the teachers working in the program have some kind of experience now post-pandemic of this kind of teaching via Zoom, et cetera, but how do you determine what kind of input sessions teachers need to help them? Um, well, yes, indeed, um, all teachers, when we started, had um, experience with remote teaching, and that's because the program started after the pandemic. Um, but um, mostly um, it comes from observations. Uh, we we do we we do observe all the teachers in the programs and and try to identify both strengths and weaknesses and 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 develop the CPD program to address especially the weaknesses and and to generate also a, an exchange between teachers so they can also learn from from each other but but it's mostly the the, the main source of the 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 content of the CPD program comes from observations. Of course, so you observe the teachers, and then you're able to determine what skills they need to work upon. Um, and how self aware have you seen teachers are when it comes to that, uh, to understanding their own needs as far as what they need to develop, how they need to develop as a teacher. So I'm, I'm fascinated. The question is because I'm fascinated by this, this idea of how teachers can become more self-aware about what they need to work upon as a teacher. Uh, this, you know, the skills of the teaching skills that they need to develop to become better teachers. Yeah. 
well, we've got almost 60 teachers in the program. Mm. So I, I, it's hard to generalize because there's yeah. a great variety among them. Uh, but I've seen uh, everything from the ones that are very self-aware from the ones who aren't <laughs> that much. <laughs> And and yes, it's very important because uh, our, our beliefs, uh, really, uh, our beliefs and previous experiences really determine our teaching practices. So it's not a matter of telling people like you need to do this. We really need them to understand it and believe that that's the way to go, and and be aware of what they are doing for 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 development to actually take place. So that's why. Um, uh, we've got two sorts of observations, uh, but uh, like one is just a short one, just to to be able to visit all classrooms and see how things are going. But then we have a more focused one that has like a pre-observation, wide observation, post-observation, interview, and and that one uh, includes a lot of reflection um, on both sides. But but we ask teachers to really. Um, like when we meet before the class to reflect and discuss what they are going to do and then take some time after the observation to reflect again about what happened, what went well, what could have been better. And and that I, I, I've I seen that has really good results. But still, uh, that's why we are now uh, implementing the peer observation and we've also recommended teachers to record themselves I don't know, we've identified some cases in which uh, instruction giving could be improved. So we've recommended like, okay, record yourself giving instructions and analyze it and see how you could do it better. Like that sort of thing that 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 helps them develop their self-awareness, I believe is, is the most effective way really. That's great. It's, it's, it's a fascinating area, I think. Teacher development has always been something I've been very interested in and knowing how you can support and encourage teachers to develop um the skills that they need to do is 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 a is such an interesting topic i think Absolutely. If, um, sorry no, go ahead. and also just no i just wanted to say that that uh we are learning so much from teachers right like, like of course we work on the areas to improve but there's also like a lot of innovation going on and good practices that, that, that we'd like them to share with each other and to the with the world because we uh really uh, we we are all learning a lot in this program i believe yeah that that i've, I've seen with remote teaching when it comes to observations not for example, in face-to-face -face teaching, I think a lot of observation done by others, apart from the peer observation that you mentioned, is really to be able to identify things that the teachers, generally a teachers need help with developing and to then work with them to, to help them develop those areas. But with remote teaching, a lot of the observation is trying is actually identifying very good practice that teachers have started to innovate and then yeah. being able to share that uh with other teachers isn't it yeah exactly so sarana you have worked face to face in schools with children you have worked with teachers remotely across borders what do you prefer, I mean, do you prefer the face-to-face -face in school, walking across the mountains and in a classroom with students' experience that you've had in Patagonia? Do you prefer the across borders, working from home, teaching, teacher development, uh, coordinate academic management that you've been doing in Colombia? Or... Is it a combination? How do you see yourself? I mean, what what is it that you like the best, if you like, if I can put you on the spot? And how do you see <laughs> yourself in the future uh, developing as a teacher, teacher educator, apart from the education, the environmental management aspects that you've already mentioned? <laughs> Well, <laughs> actually, I'd, I'd like to do both because, you know, the best of both worlds. 
um, there, there really are advantages and, and things that I love about both. Uh, the intercultural component of, of the remote teaching is really, is really rewarding and you learn so much and it makes language teaching so meaningful because like the many of the conversations that you usually have in the class when you're face to face uh, are not that meaningful. Like what's the weather like? Well, we've all come walking through the same war, um, yeah. door. But when you are in different cities or even different countries, that sort of uh, routine things have much more sense and, and students love telling you about it and, and getting you to learn about their context. Um, and also, of course, being a part of an intercultural team, it's it's so interesting because it, it, it broadens your, your, your everything, like your perspective, your um your cultural awareness it's 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 something that I, I really appreciate and grateful to be part of but of course <laughs> I love teaching face to face and being able to do that sort of thing like going on a field trip uh, with students and and looking them in the eye it, like you you can do many things to try and and simulate the experience of eye contact online but it's not it's never really eye contact for it as an example of, of some of the things that are just impossible to replicate online. Um, if I get to choose, I'd have both. <laughs> right now, I'm not teaching face-to-face, -face, but because I'm studying and, and there are only 24 hours a day. <laughs> so, <laughs> but in the future, I'm planning to to do both. Like if if this project continues um, and they continue hiring me, I'm going to be very happy to continue working for it because I'm really motivated about it. But I, I'm also planning to go back to teaching face to face because I just love it and miss it. Like this year that I'm not teaching, I'm, I'm missing it. Like I'm not teaching face to face. I'm missing it very much. Of course. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense to me. I, I understand that. I think, um, you know, I work uh, as you know, from home, uh, most of the time, my my job is a regional job, and it means um, if I were to go to our office here in Mexico City, I would be stuck in a cubicle talking to people online <laughs> anyway most of the day. So there doesn't seem to be much point other than, uh, you know, the days when I can meet people in the Mexico office face to face. But last week was the first time I went into the office um, and uh, really spent the whole day there in a couple of years. And it was fascinating just to sit next to a colleague who I haven't really, who I've been speak, speaking to every other day or so online. And just what we ended up sharing was just sort of, you know, chat basically about our lives and that kind of thing you don't get when you're working online because it, there isn't the time or the space really to do it. And I found at the end of the day, it was really enriching. Uh, I thought, uh, you know, I knew her a lot better than, than I did before the start of the day. And, um, and it was that kind of thing that I think, yeah, that, that contact with people in an informal way, in a social way, is something that is very, very hard to replicate online, isn't it? Yes. So not only the yes. eye contact aspect. I think it's, <laughs> that, it's that informal bumping into people um, yes. and just chatting, really. is very difficult to do online. Certainly. And small talk and sharing lunch and just talking about life, which like builds relationship and trust. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's just harder to do. Yeah, yeah. I think um, it's worth, if you are working online, teaching online or doing any other kind of work online, I think it's worth trying to replicate that in, in some way as far as you can. I don't think it is possible to, to do it to any great extent, but there are certainly things you can do. I think one of the things we try to do when organizing our online conference, be about last uh, February, was to try and have open rooms that anyone could just drop into and chat. So the idea of, of you know, if you have a conference, for example, a face-to-face -face conference, one of the one of the things that's really um, quite special about a face-to-face -face conference is the coffee break. So when you 
go from one session and you are going to another, but there's a coffee break in the middle. You sort of pick up a coffee and you end up just sort of randomly talking to people at the conference uh, about things. It's very easy to do. And that kind of thing doesn't happen usually at a face-to-face conference. So our idea was to have these rooms that people could kind of drop into for a chat in between sessions or the lunch break, et cetera. I don't think it was that successful, to be honest. <laughs> I don't think people ended up doing it a lot, but um, I think it's a question of trying to ferment that type of um, space and moment online it's worthwhile experimenting with to see if you can try and bring the online experience a little bit nearer to the face-to-face one. I don't see it how you would be able to do that with a program like English Without Borders um, because of the nature of it. But certainly I think more of that is worthwhile exploring with. Yeah, certainly. Certainly. I think that one of the difficulties is that, that like Zoom fatigue, we, we get really tired yeah. of being in so many um, video conferences that like we try to reduce the time when we are there as much as possible. Uh, you see, and so, I'm gonna... like the social part ends up being left behind. <laughs> I'm going to interrupt you there because I don't suffer from Zoom fatigue. <laughs> oh, you don't? No, I, I don't know why. Maybe I'm a bit... <laughs> strange but but actually i i i end up i think it's a question of i understand it and i i know why people do i think i know why people do suffer from it but um you know most of my day is spent in front of a screen talking to people etc or working in front of a screen and it's just something i've just got used to i don't actually feel that it tires me out more than it would if I was physically in an, you know, in, in an, an office in my case, or, you know, teaching in a, you know, if a teacher's teaching online, et cetera, or face to face. Because I think, I think the very fact of teaching or teacher education takes it out of you as well. You know, it drains a lot of energy. One of the benefits that I really like is not having to commute. I don't have to waste. <laughs> yes. I have to wait, waste like up to two hours of my life every day, actually getting to a place of work and coming back from a place of work, dealing with traffic, dealing with uh, the weather, etc. I think that's a real benefit. Uh, so I don't suffer from Zoom fatigue, although you know, <laughs> I know why people do. Yes. Um. I don't know. I know, uh, like I've I've read about it because I was worried about it, and 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 they mentioned this thing about like having to make a greater effort to to decode certain things because there's less body language, and also this thing, especially with teenagers, but in general of of having your own image in front of you all the time, so yeah. so you're paying a lot of attention to to that, um, and and that that sort of thing adds to adds more stress. I do feel it. I I do get like at the end of the day, I'm way more tired if I've been all day long in video conferences than if I've been all day long teaching face to face. But I don't. I honestly, I don't. I don't know how much like research. What what exactly does research say about uh, the differences? Or if yeah, I don't know if you do. I think. Uh, no, I don't. I've not seen any research. I've not looked for it either. But uh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but um, I kind of think I'm wondering how much of it is a buzzword. Uh, you know, it's a term that is like someone's coined, and people say, "Oh, yeah, yeah, that's right." And I think I think with anything, it's just um, it's just getting used to it, and and anything you do which is different to your normal experience does require more concentration more effort and does tire you out more because your attention is has to be um more sort of on so i think it's just really getting used to it so i would expect that you know video conferencing for students for example or for teachers 
teaching in this way, learning in this way was very tiring because of the mental efforts that they had to make in actually learning new things or experiencing things in a different way, et cetera. But as, as you get used to it, I can't think that, I don't think in itself it is more tiring than being in a face-to-face space, to be honest. I think it's more that. You're probably right. It's also like now you were talking, I was thinking that um, <clears throat> with kids and teenagers, but especially with kids, at least in um, the context where I've recently been working, we did a lot of um, outdoor activities and and lots of uh, yeah. TBR and that sort of thing, which is it's just harder to do in Zoom. So um, I think it was for, for kids, it was really hard to, to spend a lot of time like just in front of a device uh, because they were used to moving much more when they were in class. Uh, so that was hard to, to get used to. But but I do see your point, and I do wonder about whether it's just a buzzword. Yeah, I think I think that's what, what you've said is very true. I think you, if you are sitting in front of a a screen most of the day, then that if that's all you do, then it is very difficult. I need I need to get up and walk around uh, my my flat, and I need to take breaks, etc. So I'll you know I drink lots of tea. And uh, <laughs> that kind of thing. But I would, you would do that at school as well, wouldn't you? I mean, you would expect students. Obviously, you can physically move students a lot more during a lesson than than uh, than you you <clears throat> would do in a Zoom call, for example. But um, I think just getting the dynamic change, having them stand up, having them uh, take breaks, I think that would help. But yeah, perhaps you're right. I don't know. Who knows? Well, um, at the Bebel conference, um, I attended Lindsay Gladfield's talk, which was yeah. exactly about All that. All the micro like breaks, how... yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and he was talking exactly about that, like what things you can do like to get them to move around, to stop looking into the computer and look ahead, like I don't know how many meters in front of them, but that, that was the idea, like different ways to, to have breaks. Uh, and and to reduce this fatigue. Yes, definitely. Speaking of which, I think we should move towards winding up because I don't want to wear you out by too much screen time. I'm sure you you have other <laughs> other things to do. Which, go back to sleep. Go back to sleep, for example. <laughs> yes. Um, well, think 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 about my situation. It's actually two hours earlier where I am. So really, yeah, 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 yeah. So this is a very early start for me. Uh, <laughs> but um, yeah. Anyway, so just winding things up, um, Sarana. What what um, what to go back to living in Patagonia actually living in Patagonia rather than working or teaching in Patagonia. What are the kind of things that you miss um, from there that you're not able to do now in Uruguay? Well, Uruguay is a very flat country, you know that. Yes. (laughs) So I really, really miss mountain trekking and the snow, Um, that that sort of close connection with nature. But I'm living in, in La Paloma, which is close to the beach. So it's different nature. I'm not doing mountain trekking, but I'm doing kayaking, um, seeing whales. <laughs> and and of course I'm not teaching face to face here. So that's something but but it's it's possible. It's just that I don't have enough time for that. Um but yeah, I mean I miss it every day <laughs> but here like i'm close to my family and my friends as well which is uh, something that i had missed of course. and this job gives me the opportunity also to um to study to live wherever i i want to which is why i was able to move to la paloma and not live in the capital city which was just shocking after spending three years in Patagonia, <laughs> going back to the capital city. Uh, so that's great. And I'm also, well, I'm, I'm, I'm part of the Learning Technologies uh, Special Interest Group. Um, 
and I also get the opportunity to to balance everything out. Great. Well, it sounds like um you have enough variety to keep you busy and uh to keep you happy, which is great to hear. Thank you so much for speaking to me today, Sarana. And I apologize for getting you out of bed an hour earlier than I <laughs> than, than you thought. Just for the benefit, I don't think I mentioned it so far, but for the benefit of everybody listening, I um I told Sarana one particular time and then uh which was an hour earlier sorry, an hour later than the actual hour that we were supposed to meet. So um, you can go back to bed now. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you much. so much for having me, Graham. It's been a pleasure catching up with a you. pleasure. Yeah. Take care, Sarana. Bye. Same to you. You've been listening to Teachers Talk Radio. Tune in live and listen back at ttradio.org. We look forward to hearing from you next time on Teachers Talk Radio.